The Homelessness Awareness Month Community Forum invites both city and regional stakeholders, elected officials and city department heads, and the broader private sector, including corporations, foundations, NGOs, individuals, and civil society actors to come together to address the unmet needs of people and communities experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity. This first episode of the series entitled Shaping Bay Area Priorities with Homelessness and Affordable Housing Leaders will focus on assessing the state of homelessness and housing insecurity and look into the history of how we find ourselves where we are today. I'm sure that some of you are here because you want answers to the hard questions we've all been asking about the seeming intransigence of the challenge of homelessness. Some of you might want more clarity about what can be done and by whom. Still others may be concerned about how to keep safe and secure neighborhoods. Some of you may be here because you want your voice to be part of the conversation. It's my hope that today's forum will help lead us to better outcomes for individuals and families experiencing homelessness and begin to find ways to work together to face the challenges ahead. My partners in this conversation today are Senator Scott Weiner, former uh, District 8 Supervisor here in San Francisco, currently representing California District 11. Thank you for joining us, Senator. Um, also joining us today is Carolina Reed, Associate Professor at the Department of City and Regional Planning at UC Berkeley and Faculty Research Advisor for the Turner Center for Housing Innovation. Thank you for joining us, Professor. And finally, last but not least, we have Cynthia Nagendra, Deputy Director of Planning and Strategy at the Department of H Homelessness and Supportive Housing here in the City and County of San Francisco. Thank you for being here, Deputy Director. Um, to, get us, to kick us off, I'd like to ask Senator Weiner to kick us off. I know you've got some time constraints, so if you wanna uh, unmute yourself and hold forth, that would be great. Great, uh, thank you, Kirill. I appreciate it. Uh, and thank, thank you to all of you and thank you to Hamilton. I'm big fan of, uh, of Hamilton as an organization. Um, so uh, yeah, so COVID um, really cast a big spotlight on a lot of our uh, underlying longstanding problems. Didn't really, other than the disease itself, um, didn't create these problems, but it highlighted them, put a spotlight on them, and in some cases made them worse. Uh, and homelessness is certainly uh, one of those uh, um, problems that we've been struggling with for a very long time that's been getting worse and COVID really poured lighter fluid on it. Um, and COVID also really put a spotlight on what it means when someone doesn't have a home uh, or, or lives in uh, really substandard housing or overcrowded housing. These are issues that have existed for a long time and we, we know that if you uh, lack housing or where you have unstable housing uh, that has health impacts for people, both physical health and mental health. Uh, and of course, COVID, um, you know, really uh, uh, emphasized that. And so the hope is that um, when it comes to homelessness, that society and community has learned more um, and that we are re-energized to uh, really um, uh, end homelessness. Um, we also we have been working very hard uh, to put more resources into uh, helping get people uh, stabilized and into um, off the streets, into housing, um, investments in affordable housing, supportive housing, and expanding, uh, creating and expanding Project Home Key, uh, the twelve billion dollar uh, investment that we made uh, this year in housing, particularly for the homeless. Uh, and uh, you know increases in, uh, um, in in investment in mental health and and substance use disorder uh, treatment and so on and so forth. So we are, are are doing that work. But I think it's important to acknowledge two things, which I I know that you know, but it bears uh, emphasizing. The first is, as you know, but I think there's a a, a common misperception among members of the public um, that homeless people are all or overwhelmingly uh, people who are um, living on our streets, living on sidewalks, um, people who are um, uh, have mental health or addiction uh, challenges because people tend to assume that people that they're seeing um, on a regular basis um, in their community and they identify as homeless um, that's what homeless people are. That is, of course, one subset of our homeless population, people who are unsheltered, living on our sidewalks or in parks, um, uh, people who, um, uh, including people who have mental health or addiction challenges. Well, we know that most homeless people don't have mental health or addiction problems. And we also know that so many homeless people, uh, you uh, don't see them. 
Um, they're living either couch surfing or living in shelters or living in cars or, uh, and, and if you do see them, you wouldn't identify them as homeless. They're going to work. They're uh, bringing their kids to school. They're just trying to survive. Uh, and, um, and so I think it's so important to always keep that in mind. Yes, we need to focus on our very, very um, severe uh, street homeless uh, challenges uh, in terms of you know, California having about half of the unsheltered homeless in the entire country. Um, and we need to focus on building a much more robust mental health and addiction safety net. Uh, and, and we need to do that. We're, we're, we're doing our best now. But we need to also um, just acknowledge that, you know, fundamental to solving homelessness is fixing our broken housing um, or broken approach to housing. Because so many homeless people um, don't necessarily, um, you know, need enormous support that, uh, beyond getting a home. Um, and if you can just give them housing and some support, they're going to succeed. Others need a lot more support, of course. Um, but if there's nowhere for them to afford, um, then it's going to be hard to, to make that happen. And if you give someone short-term housing, which is great, um, but it's not long-term housing, it only kicks the can down the road and they're going to become homeless uh, again. Uh, and so that means addressing various um, aspects of our broken housing policy. It means um, strengthening uh, protections for our low-income renters so that we don't see the next wave and the next wave and the next wave of low-income renters in the Bay Area becoming homeless because they lose their home, their apartment for whatever reason, and there's just no other option uh, for them. And we are we have are at serious risk of we have a large population of low-income renters in this very expensive region. Uh, and those are potentially future homeless people, and that we can't let that happen. Um, we need to continue to invest in housing subsidies, whether it's in uh, um, uh, subsidized income restricted affordable housing, which uh, I know we're all committed to creating, whether it's buying buildings and rehabbing them and turning them into affordable housing, uh, whether it's straight up housing subsidies for people, expansion of Section 8, which I had hoped would be in the Build Back Better plan. It's um, unclear if it's going to be in there, and I hope it is. But even with that, that's, you know, we need a lot more and we need some more subsidies at the state level too. So we need all of these things. Um, but one thing I do want to emphasize is that the data we've been able to uh, uh, collect shows that about 90% of um, low income Californians um, live in market rate housing. Uh, and I would, um, I would love for us to be able to house all low income people in in subsidized income restricted um, below market rate housing. Um, but I think folks on this uh, Zoom, uh, many of whom I know who are involved in creating that housing, uh, knows that I think we all understand that it's gonna be really hard in the short run and even in the long run to create enough of that housing to address the entirety of the problem. Um, it's not cheap. To create this housing, it is. It takes a long time, uh, and we need to keep doing it. But um, if 90% of low-income people live in market-rate housing, um, if we were to even triple our low-income BMR housing stock, which would be great, I would love that. That would be a massive, massive investment if you think about it. We would still be left with 70% of low-income people living in market-rate housing. So as we push forward to invest in, a, in those subsidies um, and to increase uh, that um, affordable um, housing stock. We also have to fix the overall underlying problems for why is it so expensive to get housing in California? It used to be that if you were low income, there, there was public housing was a potential option, but there were also you know, just regular private sector options in terms of different kinds of apartments that you might be able to afford, whether it's an SRO or some other apartment. It might not be the fanciest, it might not have been the fanciest apartment in the world, but there was something that you could afford or at least stretch 
to afford. Um, and that is what has really disappeared. And the reason it's disappeared didn't just happen, it disappeared because we, for the last 50 years, decided that it wasn't important to build enough housing of any kind. Um, and so we grew as a state and we didn't add very much housing and we're building less than half of the housing per year that we should be building. Um, and we need to make it easier to build every kind of housing. We've made it, you know, I, uh, I've, I passed legislation as did David Chu um, that effectively streamlines the approval of all um, uh, low income or supportive housing in the state of California, which is great. We need to expand that and make sure that we're making it easier to build all kinds of housing. Uh, we have uh, been able to make a lot of progress on accessory dwelling units, in-law units, which are often more affordable uh, than other kinds of housing. Uh, this year, we le statewide legalized duplex zoning, because we know that single family home zoning is super exclusionary, not in every part of the state, but in a large majority. And 75% of the land in California is zoned only for single family. So if you can't afford a single family home in a community, that means that you're not allowed to live uh, in that community. Um, and so we need to continue this work to make it easier to build every kind of housing from supportive housing, affordable housing for low income residents, uh, ADUs, every kind of housing. Um, and we're doing that work to try to fix that underlying structural disaster uh, that has um, led to a lot of these problems. So it's a multi-pronged approach. Um, I know we're committed to it at the state level. Um, I know, you know we're, we're, we're trying to do more um, at the city level in San Francisco, the politics and city hall are a little challenging sometimes. Um, but uh, you know, I think we all need to lock arms. And a lot of times the housing and advocacy community uh, we tend to be fragmented into people who focus on different things. And in the end, I think we all want a lot of the same goals and we need to have a really unified coalition to say, okay, there are different strategies. We might not all agree 100% on everything, but we all agree that what is happening now is not working and we need fundamental change. So again, thank you so much for your work. Thank you so much, Senator. I really appreciate your Sort of rich contribution to the conversation and also your work around legislation. I know um, you recently worked on state bills nine and 10. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to say something about, about those bills that anything you want to share with the, the audience? Yeah, I mean, we've uh, tackled the housing crisis from a number of different angles. I mentioned the streamlining, just, yeah. you know, and, and I will say with SB 35, which is the, the bill that I carried in 2017 um, that streamlines housing approvals in cities that are not meeting their state housing goals and very few cities meet their low income housing goals. And so low income housing becomes became streamlined basically statewide. Uh, Bridge housing told me that um, with SP 35, the av their average approval time for, um, for affordable housing dropped from seven years to four months. So that those are the kinds of changes we need. Um, SB 9, this year we really focused on zoning reform, um, sort of moving away from this doctrinaire you can only have single family homes in neighborhoods. And if God forbid you have a multi-unit building in the same on the same block as single family homes, the world is gonna collapse, the sky is gonna fall. We know that's not true. Um, and it didn't used to be that way until the 60s, 70s, 80s. You people built apartment buildings, single family, just built them all in the same neighborhoods, and it was all fine, and people lived together. Um, and so this year we passed two bills, SB9, which was off, the lead author was Senator Tony Atkins, our Senate leader from San Diego, uh, which legalizes duplex zoning um, in the vast majority of the state. So people, um, even if it's single family zoning, they can build duplex. And if the lot is big enough, they can split the lot and build two duplexes. Um, so that is a real game changer in terms of zoning reform. And then I authored SB10, which is a voluntary bill for cities, but you do have cities that want to rezone for multi-unit um, in parts of their city or their whole city. Um, but because of um, CEQA, our environmental uh, law, which is a very important law that gets abused when it comes to um, housing at times, um, especially infill housing, um, uh, allows a city council to rezone for up to 10 unit buildings, as long as it's not a sprawl area without having to go through CEQA. So they can just do it without years of environmental review for an environmentally sustainable project and all the litigation that ensues. Um, so these two bills are not the end. It's it's not, you know, there's no silver bullet. 
uh, but they're a significant step forward. Thank you. That, that is, you know, moving it forward, I think, is really what we're all here for, however it takes. I know we've only got you for a few more minutes, so I want to offer the other two panelists um, an opportunity to ask you questions or provide commentary. So, uh, Professor Reed, Deputy Director McGendra, if you guys have a question for Senator Reed, while we still, well, Senator Wiener, while we still have him. Uh, so I would be interested in hearing what your priorities are for, for this upcoming legislative session. Uh, certainly the things that have been passing over the last five years have made a serious dent into a lot of the problems that we were facing. And so curious what your priorities are. Well, there are two things that I would love to do next year if we can achieve some sort of peace or detente between the affordable housing uh, bill world and the building trades because there's been a lot of uh, biting and tension and it has slowed down some of our work. Uh, one is I had a bill last year that I had to end up abandoning because of that fight and it had become like just too intense uh, and that is our church housing bill. Um, that bill, it was SB 899 last year, would have allowed religious institutions and nonprofit colleges if they had excess land to be able to automatically Likely develop that land as 100% um, affordable housing. Um, they it would automatically be rezoned and automatically ministerially approved. So no CEQA, no discretionary review, no conditional use. Um, and we know that with churches in particular, the amount of excess land that could be developed as affordable housing in the state of California, it's hard to even, it's absolutely massive, even in San Francisco, because I assume that San Francisco wouldn't have as much. I forget what the number is in San Francisco. It's actually really significant. And when you start getting into suburban areas, it's just massive. These churches that have a lot of land uh, or they have a huge parking lot and maybe a shrinking congregation, they don't need that whole parking lot. And so it would create enormous amount of land set aside for affordable housing. We had to abandon it because of the fight between labor and the affordable housers, but I would love get that resolved so I can reintroduce that bill. And then I mentioned SB 35, our streamlining bill that's been a big boon for both affordable and mixed income housing. Um, I would like to remove the sunset on that uh, bill and perhaps expand it. So those are the two things I would like to do next year. It's too soon to say whether I'll be able to. And of course, we're always on the lookout for other uh, good ideas. So I do have to go, I apologize for that. We're. Uh, Mayor's about to swear in a new city attorney. I'm sad to lose Assemblymember Chu uh, as a colleague in the Assembly, but he'll be a great city attorney. Yeah, he sure will. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your Thank time. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. You too. Um, Professor Reed, if you want to step up to the mic next, um, and maybe you have some comments on what Senator Weiner said or led to, or if you have your own take on the challenges facing us with regard to homelessness and housing insecurity, happy to have you take the helm. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. And Cynthia, please jump in if you have things that you want to add, because uh, I know you've been in this space a really long time, too. Um, and uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us about this conversation. Um, First, I think we're going to say, I'm going to say that uh, we're lucky to have Senator Weiner and have somebody who is so well versed and understands housing issues and has been uh, fighting pretty tirelessly to, to address them. Um, I think his focus on housing as the fundamental cause of homelessness is really important. Um, because we do forget that. We think that it is driven by mental illness or driven by substance abuse or driven by other individual failings. But the research really shows the very strong relationship between housing affordability and homelessness. And we can see that in cities across the country. And certainly the Bay Area's crisis is driven primarily by the lack of housing and the lack of affordable housing. Um, I will say that it's not the only issue. And I think uh, Senator Weiner sort of hinted at it where he mentioned that we tend to think about people who are experiencing homelessness as those who are very visible and those that are on our streets and who may have visible issues with mental illness or substance abuse when in fact a huge share of our homeless population are people who are working. 
um, and who are just not earning enough to afford housing. And so um, I think as we continue the conversation, I'd love to also focus on the labor market side and recognize that uh, you know, incomes and the social safety net and the, the factors that allow people to afford housing are also a really important piece of the puzzle. Thank you. Uh, I have a quick question for you apropos of what you just raised about housing being the fundamental cause of homelessness. Um, we look at the numbers here at Hamilton Families and we know that we serve, you know, something like 85% of the families that we serve are led by single moms of color. And that the number is so disproportionate that it makes us wonder, are there structural issues that are also at play here as well? Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, I know, or, or also, Cynthia, if you feel like you want to hold forth as well. Um, I think this is a, a pretty complicated issue. You know, we know that uh, African-Americans are disproportionately represented in the numbers of homeless folks in, in the city of San Francisco and in the state of California. So there, that's not a coincidence. And we know that that's not, it's not magic. It's not, you know, that's not something that just kind of happened. And maybe you can talk a little bit more about sort of structural factors in addition to a lack of affordable housing that sort of lead to the kind of outcomes that we're seeing here on the ground. Yeah, absolutely. And we can trace it through, I mean, I think structural is exactly the right word, right? And, and if we think about it, it really is structural racism that plays out in through every entire system we have, be it the housing system, the labor market, our um, uh, criminal justice system, right? Like all of these factors are interrelated. Um, I have been doing some recent research on extremely low income households in San Francisco, or actually in the nine county Bay Area. And what we know is that these extremely low income families are, and I think Senator Weiner sort of hinted at this, right, they're the ones who are at biggest risk of falling into homelessness. Um, this is sort of our, our pipeline into homelessness that we really need to address if we want to address homelessness in the Bay Area. Um, a quarter of Black individuals in the Bay Area, so 25, more than 25% of Black individuals in the Bay Area are represented in these ELI households, uh, even though they are a much smaller share. Uh, well, so, sorry, I didn't say that very well. 25% of Black individuals are in ELI households compared to just 9% of non-Hispanic whites. When we look at why, Right, we see one is because they're also overrepresented in the ELI labor force. So they are much more likely to work in a job that does not pay a living wage. Second, they're much more likely to experience housing discrimination, certainly in the housing market, but even if they have a housing voucher, we know from research that if you are a black female person with a housing voucher, you are significantly more likely to be denied access to housing than not. So it's intersectional, right? It's like the landlord is discriminating based because you're black, because you're a woman, because you have a housing voucher, because you have kids, which makes it harder to find housing. And so that's how you end up uh, without housing. Um, and again, you know, criminal justice system, that's not an area that I study very much, but, but we know sort of the, the consequences of a, a, a very strong uh, link between criminal justice, housing, um, labor market outcomes, and, and you know, bad household outcomes. Cynthia, do you want to add stuff, particularly maybe on the health side? Yeah, actually, I mean, I, this is actually where I was going to even begin my comments on the structural causes of homelessness. So I think we've really... Uh, covered those, the drivers being, yes, permanent housing is critical. We know permanent housing ends homelessness, but there are these systemic drivers, and we've named them high cost of housing, inadequate wages, um, so severe economic inequity, uh, and disparity, but structural racism and other systemic marginalization that has kept people from, for decades, if not much longer, from accessing permanent housing, housing opportunities, just things like redlining, um, you know, years and years of being discriminated against in buying housing, Black or African American community not being able to access the same kind of housing opportunities that builds wealth in America. One of the best ways to build wealth in America, if not one of the only ways, is to build housing, is to buy housing and pass that down through generational wealth. Uh, and, and when you don't start there, it's very, very difficult to build wealth if you're a renter, especially if you're in an extremely low income situation and where rent is even unaffordable. So these systemic drivers that are especially structural racism that keeps people out of employment, education and housing 
uh, make it pretty mm -hmm. difficult and really are telling the story of why we see um, uh, a disparity of, you know, 6% of people in, in the general population in San Francisco are Black or African American, and 37 to 40% of people are uh, Black or African American in the homeless population. And so that, that those numbers, while they're quite um, stark, uh, and, and uh, they're, they're, they match a lot of what's going on across California and across the country. Um, so Caroline has already mentioned this, but the, the sort of and the health side too, then not being able to access health services, right? So if you're someone who was um, in the 60s and 70s when you had um, a pension, when you had healthcare, when you had employment, you had all these kinds of things that were much more stabilizing. If you don't have those things now and you have one health scare, you have a, a family member, a parent, a child that has a disability that can destroy your, your entire stability, right? You're what we learned during COVID, you're one paycheck away from potentially having to live in your car with your family. So those kinds of choices are just more and more, um, uh, just take up so much more of the of people's experience now, especially in, in expensive cities. So those things are, and I, I'm going to talk about this a bit more, but those economic factors are not meant to sort of say, okay, we can't solve this problem. It does mean that the, that the depth of the problem, the structural changes are, are going to be what's really, and that's what is required and why we're, seeing increases of homelessness is not because we're not rehousing people we could do better certainly but it's because we have these economic drivers um, and these structural drivers that are, are required deep policy change so i mean uh, what we're describing is a really complex set of problems not even just one problem it's a constellation of challenges right there's challenges in the political realm there's challenges in the health realm there's challenges in the housing market there's housing there's challenges all across the system and i'm wondering the two of you as people who are, have been thinking and working in this field for quite a long time, how do we, what's the right sort of sequence of events to sort of untangle this sort of knot of a mess that, that we've got in front of us? Because it, I don't, sometimes as a provider, you know, we can see in a tunnel, you know, we see the people in front of us, the families in front of us, and we want to serve those families. But there's sort of a, a way to sort of get at a different altitude and really sort of look at the problem from up here. So maybe one of you, or both of you, please uh, could talk to you, talk to us about getting to that altitude and really sort of thinking about ways that we can sort of really be intentional about deliberately sort of untangling all the complex pieces of this challenge. Yeah, Cynthia, do you want me to start or you want to go first? Go ahead. Um, so uh, I've been thinking about this a lot and particularly around this sort of uh, stopping the, the factors that drive people into homelessness. So I think when we look at people who are currently unhoused, we, we know what strategies work and we really just need to make both the political will and the investment to helping them get housed. I think when we think about sort of the, the long-term structural problems, there's three that we need to address and we need to address them simultaneously. I think the problem has been, we sort of pick off one or the other and we think that that's gonna solve the problem and it won't because as you say, it's this interconnected web. Um, the first is we have to, as a country, um, reimagine our social safety net. We are the only uh, sort of, you know, Northern European developed global North country that does not provide real family leave, that doesn't provide real childcare supports, that doesn't provide real payments for people who have disabilities and can't work, right? We, we, we need to re-knit this social safety net um, and really reimagine it. And I think what we see in these guaranteed income demonstration pilots is that when you give people money, they spend it on making their families thrive, right? They, they use it to pay for rent. They use it to pay for healthcare. They use it to pay for food or their kids' books or these other things. So this whole sort of undeserving poor narrative that we have uh, continually emphasized in the US is just false and not doing us any favors. Um, the second is housing assistance and housing supply. And those have to be uh, pursued simultaneously. So we need to give people direct housing subsidies for those who need it. Um, but we also need to continually expand the supply of housing so that those people who have a housing assistant has a place to use it. Um, and I think Senator Weiner talked about that quite extensively. Um, the third piece is we really, really need to think our labor market. In the Bay Area, we've been creating very high wage jobs, right? Our millionaires and our billionaires, <laughs> um, or our 600,000ers, um, and we've been creating low wage jobs. 
the average ELI worker in the Bay Area is making $17,000 a year in a region where the median income is $130,000. And these are jobs that we all rely on. There are janitors, there are um, housekeepers, there are childcare workers, there are people who work uh, for homelessness care agencies who are not making enough money to live here in the Bay Area. And so we really need to push towards living wage jobs. We need to push to the jobs with healthcare. Uh, to Cynthia's earlier point, 30% uh, of working ELI, only 30% of ELI working individuals have access to healthcare through their employer compared to almost 90% of higher income workers. Right, so we really need to renet and rethink the labor market and build more pathways for economic mobility. I'll stop there, Cynthia. I mean, I mean that is um, an excellent foundation, and, and touches on a lot of what I um, would also say. But I, when I think about from the Department of, I work at the Department of Homelessness, and so when I try to think about, okay, what is the you know, we have this emergency situation, a really public health crisis on the street that we have to focus on right now. And then we have these long structural complex changes that need to happen in our country. So I think, I think to your question too, Carol, that, you know, how do we, how do we sort of detangle us and also how do we kind of sequence things? And it's, you know, it's obviously a, a both and strategy because what I've seen, I've worked in homelessness for um, almost two decades. And I think certainly the fundamentals that permanent housing ends homelessness and most people don't need a ton of services. Most people just need rent money or housing money. Um, and a lot of what people's, um, a lot of what uh, might have contributed towards their homelessness, the economic um, issues that it contributed, you know, and, and a lot of the sort of mental health and substance use issues that may um, have contributed to less than one third of people experiencing homelessness usually, those often stabilize when someone's in housing. You can't get treatment when you are, you can't really, you know, get proper substance in a mental health treatment if you're living outside. It's just not, or even in a shelter, it's very difficult. So we know that permanent housing with, with some services and for a small percentage more intensive services um, and homelessness, but we also know that people are still poor when they when they get into that housing, which is, is very challenging, but that most people keep their housing. Um, and what is what is challenging is then this is basically a market rate solution, right? So or a market, a market-based solution. And so changing the market, navigating the market that is. We have to do both. So navigating the market that is that we currently have in San Francisco and the Bay Area, that's what homeless providers um, have been doing. And I think that the homeless services field has become incredibly smart, incredibly efficient, incredibly strategic. Hamilton is an excellent um, example of this, of figuring out how to navigate this market. How do we get really poor households who are going to have all of these things that are, are, are barriers. How do we remove those barriers as much as possible and get folks into market rate housing? We subsidize it, we provide services, we provide housing location, we get professional real estate um, and property manager people, you know, like a workforce of folks that, and, that can do that, can locate housing, get pipelines of units. We've learned how to do that and I'm not saying that we don't, we definitely need to scale that up and it's expensive and it's difficult and it's hard. We have a workforce issue in the homelessness field too. So what I see in San Francisco is that we need to, there's the building permanent housing and building affordable housing side. So that needs to be quicker, more cost-effective. The things secretary, I'm sorry, Senator Weiner was saying about, you know, being able to cite site more quickly, get to review more quickly. Um, we need a lot more yes in my backyard. You know, even the, I'm sure you've seen the department homelessness is trying to buy all these buildings and we're, there's a lot of pushback. Um, understandably, there's lots of reasons people have, um, you know, people have reasons for that, but we have to, you know, we have to have some sort of compromise there. But then in terms of using the rental market, what I'm seeing is we have all of this money flooding into San Francisco for the first time. Maybe, maybe it's an unprecedented opportunity from the state, from the federal government, and from our local, this tax ordinance we passed. We could, we're gonna house thousands of people with this money, but we have to build the infrastructure, the service services infrastructure, the nonprofit infrastructure, and we have to find enough units to put people into. So we're not displacing people uh, at rates that don't make sense, moving them away from their communities, from their jobs. And so how do we do that? What I'm seeing is a capacity issue on the service provider side. I think that there is not, not no fault of the service provider. We either have to, invest heavily into building that capacity so we have a sustainable rehousing system 
for homeless people and people experiencing homelessness and at risk of homelessness. And we also need partnerships in the private market, the real estate market, um, and affordable housing. I just don't know how we can do this. We, we're bailing the water out, I think, as fast as we can in the homeless system, but we have to turn that tap down. And we need people to, you know, we need places for people to go permanently. And shelter is important, but as we said, I think early on, shelter, oh, I think someone said this earlier, maybe shelter is temporary. You don't have a place to exit people into. We can build shelter until forever because it'll just keep filling up. So these things have to kind of happen together where we're building capacity in the homeless system, we're rehousing people, we're preventing homelessness, and we're doing major structural policy change. So it's, it's, it's very simple. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I believe I agree that it's a really compli complicated challenge to sort of sequence, but also, I mean, I guess my question to you two as panelists is, you know, where does the responsibility to oversee uh, all of the, you know, things have to happen in a bunch of different arenas, public and in private and across provider sectors. And so where's the, where do you think is the best place for oversight of that sort of transformation of, you know, reimagining the social safety net? looking at housing assistance and housing supply, looking at the labor market, like where does that live? Is that a federal responsibility? Is it a local responsibility? It is a, is it a nonprofit responsibility? Where does it, where does it, where would it best, where would, where would we best be served for that to, to land? Yeah, so I would say all of the above, right? We, <laughs> uh, I know that's a little bit of a cop out, but it's, it's the truth, all of the above. Um, I, I am heartened by the fact that we have an administration at the federal level now who really is trying to re reimagine, re-knit that social safety net. Um, the, even we, we learned even with the COVID pandemic that the assistance that the federal government provided uh, kept more people out of poverty um, than anything that we've done in the past. And the child tax credit that they are hoping to make permanent um, would do significant amounts to help ELI households in the Bay Area and really across the country. And so I do think you need a strong federal government. On, on housing vouchers and Section 8 vouchers, which Senator Weiner sort of raised as one potential for helping to address these problems, that really needs to be a federal government role. Um, just because of the expense of vouchers and the fact that the federal government can run at a deficit, um, which uh, other government levels can't. And once, once you extend one of those vouchers, you can't take it away, right? So it's, it's not going to um, get less expensive over time. Um, but there's things the state can do. And I do think things like SB 35, which uh, helps to make affordable housing more easy and more quick to build, can be really important. Uh, there was a question in the discussion and answer, the question and answer box about uh, who's in charge of making sure discrimination doesn't happen. Uh, California, a couple of years ago, passed the uh, source of income discrimination law. So now landlords cannot discriminate against people who have a voucher. Um, that requires accountability and oversight. And I think um, the, the new accountability office at the state might help with that, um, but we certainly need to figure out ways to enforce it because otherwise it's meaningless. Um, and then I do think, as Cynthia said, right, like there's roles for local governments, um, there's roles for foundations for helping to invest in innovation and develop strategies that are uh, effective, right? We wouldn't know how important guaranteed income is if there hadn't been pilots that were funded with philanthropic dollars. I think the um, work that Tipping Point and others have done to try and streamline and build uh, permanent supportive housing in San Francisco more quickly using modular is an example of where foundations um, can sort of use capital to do things and, and sort of learn innovations that then can be replicated at scale through government funding. Um, so I think there's lots of opportunities, but um, I also think it's partly a change in the mind of the public, right? Recognizing that the people uh, who are in need are our neighbors um, and, and we should not uh, see them as separate from ourselves. I think this is something we often talk about here at Hamilton Families is about bridging the empathy gap that I think this is something that you raised, a question that you raised earlier about there being an ongoing sort of public narrative about the undeserving poor. How do we, you know, from a systems perspective, how do we, how do we set about 
bridging the empathy gap such that you know people look at folks experiencing homelessness and see their brothers and sisters and their nephews, their neighbors, their uncles and aunts, and, and not that person, that person to step over as they go to their, you know, buy their six dollar latte and off to their hundred thousand dollar job. How do we how can we best go about doing that? What levers do we need to pull to sort of make that happen? I can, I mean, this has been an ongoing question in our field, I think, for a long time, but I do think we're, it feels like we're at more of a, a turning point in terms of people's frustration and uh, both uh, both being more empathetic and less, and just more frustrated at wanting to live in a community or in, in neighborhoods that feel healthy and safe and um, for everybody, for everybody, not, not just for people who are housed, but for people who are unhoused and that we are all, you know, we are all residents of the same community. And so I think that, you know, some of the research that's been done about, um, there's some recent research from um, a group called Invisible People who did um, a ton of research asking people with lived experience and residents and focus groups with communities all over the country um, and, and businesses uh, and other stakeholders, you know, why do you feel, what do you think about homelessness? What do you think is going to solve it? So there's a fundamental just misunderstanding about what, 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 what homelessness is and why it happens. America also has a very, um, you know, a very kind of uh, a narrative that there's a meritocracy and there's an independent, you should just be able to, everyone starts from the same place. You know, I, I think that here in the Bay Area, we understand that that is not the case, but we really have to be able to, I think, as for all people who live across the state, understand that that might mean you have to sacrifice something to, to actually be able to have a, um, to have the social fabric of equity that we talk about. Um, and so helping people understand exactly why people are homeless and what what you know what the barriers are, the structural barriers are. Now, I think most people don't don't really necessarily want to learn about all that, but I do think that sort of fundamental understanding does help sometimes. Very local level when you're trying to when people ask me like how you know how can we fix this problem? It's usually well, let there be housing built in your community or let there be, don't, don't, don't speak out, you know, understanding that, yes, it might cause a shadow and there might be more traffic, try to balance that out with the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, and I think that the more advocacy we have around things like fourplexes and like not single family homes not being the only way to, you know, that time, things have changed since the 60s and 70s and we have more people. And if we want this to be the center of industry, Around tech, that for, I think it's like something. Like, I know, Caroline, you can you can um, correct me that for one every thousand jobs, I think we've built like one unit of housing or something over the last decade that we bring in. So in any case, I mean, it's not a it's not a a, a quick answer. I think that there's many levels, and it depends on the uh, the audience you're talking to. I think there's a business case to be made to the public, like it's cheaper and more effective to have everyone be housed. Um, there's an empathy. In some people to why this is right, but I think the economic um, sort of argument is the one that usually wins out. That this is just the more, you know, it's better for everybody, health and economic wise. Yeah, and I think, I mean, that's where the research really does show that if we could just change our political calculus and recognize that prevention is cheaper than the, you know, the, the, the downstream effects of homelessness, um, we know from research that even providing a voucher is cheaper than letting somebody fall into homelessness and then having to rehouse them. Um, and, and we spend money all the time, right? One of my sort of talking points is that we spend more on mortgage interest tax deduction and proper Prop 13 tax benefits for wealthy homeowners than we do on affordable housing for ELI households. And so we, we have the money to spend. It is how do we spend it and how do we make those political decisions to spend it on people who are um, really, you know, suffering from the sort of structural inequities of our labor and housing markets. Can one of you, for the sake of folks in our audience who may not know how vouchers work, can one of you speak to how the voucher system, Section 8, for example, uh, or permanent supportive housing, how, does, how do those systems work? I can talk about the supportive housing piece. Um, permanent supportive housing, there's, there's actually a lot of permanent housing options for people experiencing homelessness, and that can be a shorter term rental subsidy, like rapid rehousing, there can be prevention rental assistance, and permanent supportive housing is something that's been um, the most studied uh, for people experiencing chronically chronic homelessness, where usually people who've been homeless many times or for a long period of time and have a disability, 
permanent supportive housing is permanent housing that comes with intensive supports that is individualized to the person or household that may need them. Um, and that can range from treatment to case management to all kinds of supports a person might need. Um, and over time, usually the per a lot of people need less, uh, less of those services. That system usually is funded through federal and mostly federal funding through HUD. Um, and it, 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 you, in each community has what's called a, a HUD continuum of care. You come through a process in which you are assessed to see if you are um, eligible for to be funded to get permanent sort of housing. Um, and unfortunately, because it's been there's been such a small the, the amount of resources available for the need has been so small. We've had to spend a lot of time prioritizing that housing for people. And if it was, if we had more of it, we wouldn't have to spend so much time prioritizing it. Um, that comes mostly through local nonprofits and local cities and counties. The voucher system usually comes through um, public housing authorities. John, you can probably speak more to that. Yeah, so the federal government has something called the Housing Choice Voucher Program. So it's administered through public housing agencies for the most part. And for households who get one of these vouchers, they rent a unit in the private market. So they have to find a unit with that voucher, but the voucher pays the difference between what's called a fair market rent, which is a, a sort of a maximum rent set by the federal government um, and 30% of that person's income. So if that person makes $3,000 a year, uh, they would pay $1,000 in rent and if the rent was higher than that, the federal government would subsidize the difference. If that household was making $600 a month, they would pay $200 a month in rent and the federal government would subsidize the rest. Um, and so it's a, it's a really valuable benefit because it scales to that household's income and it makes sure that they are never spending more on rent than they can actually afford and that they have income to afford you know, others' life needs. Um, the downside in the place in a place like the Bay Area, where you have such a tight rental market, is that it's hard to find units that will take one of these vouchers. There's an administrative burden to the landlord, and there's also a stigma associated with these vouchers. And so in a market where landlords can be choosy about who they want to rent to, it becomes that much harder to find a unit and to find a unit that is below this fair market rent, which is the rent that is set as sort of the maximum allowable. And so this is why expanding vouchers needs to go in tandem with expanding supply, because otherwise, even with a voucher, it might be very difficult to find a unit and you're, or you're going to Sacramento or Stockton or sort of you know having to, to move away from your family and your networks of care. I think this is what I say that it goes back to kind of um, I was saying earlier, you know, we've, we've got these the service provider um, expertise about how to help people navigate this incredibly difficult housing market. Like, so I know Hamilton has this amazing real estate property and housing team. They, you know, have landlord relationships and they know how to um, kind of create this pipeline of, of how to place people in housing based on incentives and trusting relationships and all of these things. And that really helps a person who might, who might not if they were out there on their own looking for housing. But I think that, and we figured out some incentive structures that work for landlords. And I think that there's more to be thought out there. The same way we need to incentivize affordable housing to pencil out, we have to incentivize landlords in some way so that we're not, you know, there's a lot of arguments about how we're subsidizing higher rents and all of that, but we really do have to work with the market we have and figure out how to incentivize um, the, the, the private market to be able to engage them. We have thousands of subsidies available. I think one of the challenges we're gonna have is placing people into, into available units. How do we compete? So I think there is innovation happening around that, um, both around building housing and placing people into housing um, and then preventing people from falling out. But I think that's where we could do a lot more work with private market actors or um, researchers, or I think that there's there's just, that's where I think we can focus our attention instead of putting more and more and more on service providers, which is gonna happen anyway. We just have to expand the amount of people who are doing this work. And that means, you know, the service providers, state, local, federal, it just has to, um, plan three, just how to, 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 to figure out how to make this more sustainable. Yeah, I totally agree. One of the things that our real estate team has learned is that many landlords, you know, are happy to find um, 
tenants who have subsidies because it means that they're going to get at least part of their rent. You know what I mean? That it's better than nothing um, in places where you know housing is more available than it is here in the city of San Francisco. You know, people out on the East Bay where you know the landlords are worried about not not filling their units with with families who can pay their rent, but a subsidy means or a voucher means that they'll get at least part of part of their rent, um, if not all of it. Um, I know we're getting near time, and there's a question in the chat uh, in the question and answer box that Marcia Sprinkle. Um, for those of us not new to the field, but new to the Bay Area, can this panel or a future one address the existence of advocacy and service organizations in the area, and how are they coordinating or cooperating? Is there an overall coalition of groups addressing homelessness? Um, please hold for. <laughs> I mean, you've both been around for long enough. You, you know all. You know where all the bodies are. There's a lot of locally. There's a lot of advocacy bodies um, that either work on you know very small like specific subpopulation issues. So. Um, whether that's family, transition, transition age youth, um, LGBTQ, there's a lot of sort of advocacy communities that I could I could send sort of like put down a list. I think state wise and advocacy wise, state and policy advocacy wise, there's uh, housing California is an as an excellent way to sort of really understand what the housing in California the, the state legislative issues are and what to advocate for. Um, I know that Carolyn, you can probably speak more to kind of local. Um, policy advocacy bodies. Yeah, there's, I mean, the, 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 the strength of the Bay Area is that there's so much richness in terms of organizations that are working on everything from tenant protections to uh, direct assistance to policy advocacy at the state level. Um, I think the, the, the challenge I think has been in part that homelessness has been seen somewhat separate from housing. And so those groups don't always communicate, um, but uh, East Bay Housing Organizations, EBHO is a great coalition of organizations. Um, uh, I'm thinking about All Home, which is a new nonprofit in uh, the Bay Area that is trying to address homelessness um, at the regional scale and bringing lots of different partners together around that. Um, Housing California is great. Um, I'm, I'm blanking on the other one, but uh, there's there's no shortage of ways to get involved. There's also uh, locally there's we've got Coalition Against Homelessness, and we also have HESPA, which is the Homeless Emergency Service Providers Association, which um, is a coalition of providers who do advocacy work a lot, most, mostly around the city budget. And making sure that funds are getting funneled to uh, communities experiencing homelessness. So that's also a place to get involved if you'd like. Um, this is definitely an area that we're going to address at future sessions in this uh, in, in this community forum series. So please, if you're interested in this question, we'll have some of those folks uh, coming to join us in subsequent weeks. Um, I don't know if there, we've got a couple of minutes left, and I want to let our, your, our panelists, if there's something pressing that you feel like you didn't get to say or what would like our audience to hear before we close. Um, this is your your time to shine. I mean, I just want to say that, I mean, I know we've talked about the complexities of this issue and it is to explain why it looks like nothing is being done when so much is being done. People are working so hard to solve this issue, but because we have more people going into homelessness, it's hard to see that. I mean, the visible homelessness seems like something that is 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 not changing, but it is. So the thing I want to end with is that homelessness is not an intractable issue. It has a solution. We've seen for 10, from until about a couple of years ago, homelessness ticked down year over year um, because housing first and all of the focus on people getting housed and um, not requiring, um, you know, getting people housed first and then giving them the support they need and putting more and more money into that, that works. Um, this is an issue that's solvable. It's unacceptable to have this issue in the Bay Area. Um, and there is a solution, but we really have to think um, in a much more sort of innovative, strategic, complex way, or continue to do that um, and not think that they're, they're, it's just all on the homeless system. I totally agree that it's solvable. Professor Reed, do you want to have any last words for our audience? I was just gonna say plus one to Cynthia, <laughs> right? And also just because it's complicated doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep working at it, right? And I think uh, we do know what the solutions are. They are all within our grasp. We have the talent and the resources here in the Bay Area to do it. And so it's gonna just require that sustained engagement and great groups like Hamilton to sort of constantly say, right? Like, let's not let this become invisible again. Right. 
Right, absolutely. I mean, I think some of the work that we've been doing over the last you know, 30 years or so has really been to sort of highlight, you know, the fact that you don't see families in the street, generally, generally speaking. You, you, they're, you know, it's family, family homelessness is invisible. You don't see them. Folks are in cars, they're in hotels, they're couch surfing at their aunties or what have you. And so, you know, people don't actually think that there are as many families who are experiencing homelessness as there are. And that's been part of our challenge is really to sort of change the narrative around that over the years so that people really do understand that it's not just, you know, folks who are struggling with substance use issues or mental health, but it is also, you know, people with families are taking their kids to school and so on. Um, and that, that's been part of the work that we've been doing over time. Um, I really want to thank you both, uh, also on Senator Wiener, wherever you are, uh, you know, for, for being with us on this first sort of inaugural uh, Hamilton Families Community Forum. I really appreciate your expertise and your insight and your willingness to share them with us today. Um, thank you so much, and we hope to see more of you uh, as we continue the series. Thanks so much for having us, and thank you everyone for participating. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for inviting and for doing the series. It sounds wonderful. Yeah. I'm looking forward to the rest of it. We've got four more four more weeks of it, so I'm, I'm excited about continuing the series and where the conversations go. And thank you for doing the work that you do. It's very difficult. It is. Someone's got to do it, right? Why not us? And thank you for being a great partner, Cynthia. I really appreciate the work that you guys are doing at HSH. Um, it's really a good, strong partnership with the city, I think. It's really excellent. Take good care, everybody. Have a good day. See you thank next you. week. <laughs>